The Oscars are still a month away, but it's not too early to talk about best picture contenders today. I'm going to rank them. Let's do it. What is up, Flick fans? Welcome back to my channel. Every year we get our best picture contenders, and sometimes I'm like, that's why is that, why is that movie nominated? Honesty time this year, I actually like all of the best picture contenders. Do I love all 10? Not necessarily. Would I nominate other movies ahead of a couple on this list? Absolutely. But that's just taste, man. That's just, that's how it goes. Is this video going to have unpopular opinions? Yes. Are some on Twitter going to look at this video and go, actually, wow, this man has no taste. I don't care about that. I care about you all. What is your top 10? List these movies in order from least favorite to most favorite. If you want to drop a like down below, man, that would be... I'm not begging. Yes, I am. As always, we're going to start this list with honorable mentions. And the first movie is... We don't have honorable mentions, so let's, let's go to number 10. Number 10, Triangle of Sadness. This is where I said some people may get frustrated. And it's not that I didn't like Triangle of Sadness. I think this is a good movie. Do I personally believe... It belongs on this list? Not necessarily. I have a couple of issues with this film that kind of go beyond the message. I think the message is very evident. It's clear. It's there. There are themes in this movie that are important. A lot of people want to liken it to a film like The Menu from last year. And for some reason, that's become a debate on Twitter. Are you team Triangle of Sadness? Or are you team The Menu? I mean, if I had to choose, I would choose The Menu. Some people don't like that. I don't care. But this movie is obviously playing upon the rich, how that power dynamic shifts drastically in the third act, and how chaos ensues in the second act to get them to that point. We spend a lot of time building up this main couple in the beginning, only to kind of forget about them with the rest of the film, which I struggled with, and I, I struggled with certain moments in this story that didn't quite suck me in as they intended. It's very clear that they're going for multiple knockout punches as you go, and I'm trying my best to tiptoe around certain plot points, but uh, things go absolutely insane at a point in this film. Uh, and there are so many aspects of how this film slowly descends into madness that will have some people scratching their heads, like, why am I watching all of this chaos and suit? Lots of vomiting in this film, which I did find funny. But I saw a lot of people find this movie a lot funnier than I did, only because I wasn't quite fully on board. That's a pun because they're on a boat, but on board with what they were going through. And at a point, you kind of know exactly where it's going to go. I talked about that role reversal and how uh, you have so many really evident and important themes here, right? How the rich are so fixated on money and how gender and power dynamics can shift so drastically in an instant, right? The performances are great. They really are. Even down to Woody Harrelson, who was in the movie way less than I expected him to be. Uh, Dolly De Leon, obviously, she is the highlight. She's the standout. I agree with all of the people that were predicting her and, and possibly nominating her for an Oscar. And the way this film is crafted, I think Ruben Oslin does a really nice job. Obviously, there's a Best Director nomination there. But for me, I just wasn't as invested as I needed to be. I found the length of the film to be testing. I, I was growing impatient. As we move throughout this film, which obviously wasn't how I was supposed to feel. I like the fact that this movie obviously had a message. It was harshly criticizing the rich for about 40 straight minutes. I found as certain moments like that to be somewhat on the nose. And then other moments that just didn't quite click. But then again, certain sequences that just go off the rails, like the one in the second act, and then a lot of elements in the third act, those moments worked extremely well. So I appreciate the quality, the direction, the acting so much that I am fairly positive with this film. But again, it's at the bottom of this list because I wasn't fully invested and it just didn't really resonate with me after it was oh, I People are going to be so pissed. Next up, baby Elvis, thank you very much. I sound more like Johnny Bravo. Oh, mama. Austin Butler in Elvis. It's up to him, really, to carry us through this film, right? Baz Luhrmann, he has a distinct style. There is a lot crammed into this runtime. And some people watch this and they're like, oh my god, I can't believe they got 40-something years packed into one film and they were able to give us, you know, so much from that. That's kind of how I felt while watching, and that's not necessarily a great thing, right? It feels like we're skipping moments, we're skipping elements, we're skipping relationships. That relationship between Elvis and his mother is something that I expected to be explored way more than it actually was. But at the same time, I understand the argument of, well, they had a lot to do within this film, so it kind of goes both ways. It makes me think that this would have been better served 
as a miniseries, as a six-episode miniseries, just because they go through so many things. But I get it. I get why Baz Luhrmann wanted to make this a film. And as a fast-paced, music-fueled experience, especially watching it on the big screen with those concert scenes, I understand why people love this movie. I really do. I don't quite love it as a movie, but I really enjoyed the experience. And I was I was floored by Austin Butler. Again, I do believe there are style over substance elements here with Elvis. There's just a lot going on at points. And then you have my biggest criticism with this film. The fact that it was told through Tom Hanks' his character's perspective, that voiceover, which I didn't really love, and really Tom Hanks... As the, I just didn't really love the performance, to be honest with you. I know it, it, people love Tom Hanks. I think he's amazing. He was really good in A Man Called Otto. He you know, deserves to be nominated for awards every single year. This is one of those performances that didn't necessarily work for me. It was over the top, and I get it. It was supposed to be over the top. Asked in this movie's based on a book, and they told his perspective in the book. I get it. And that's fine. I appreciate the fact that they stuck to the book. It just didn't quite work in movie form. Uh, that being said... There are a couple of scenes in this movie that are amongst my favorites of the year. And as, like I said, an experience, Elvis does work. And I would gladly watch it again just to see him sink into this character. Do I believe this one deserved to be nominated for Best Picture? Again, I would put some movies above this, but I'm not overly agitated like I am with some other films in other years. Sarah Polly, Women Talking. We want to talk about a great script. This is what stands out about women talking, is the dialogue. I think the screenplay, the overall story, the, the direction that it goes in is good. I think the performances are, they're actually great, not as good as the dialogue. Here's my issue just off the bat with this film. Visually, it's okay. It's nothing spectacular. It doesn't quite hold a candle to some of these other Oscar-nominated movies on a technical level. I think they could have done certain things better, and it doesn't go beyond what it says it is, and it is a lot of uh, these people in one room talking, but some of the best movies are that. I mean, 12 Angry Men, I'm not making that comparison fully, but there are similarities between this and that, just different circumstances, different story. Yeah, this group of women, they're isolated in this religious colony, and they're trying to reconcile their faith with a string of sexual assaults committed by the colony's men. That's the description. That is essentially what the movie is. And you get so many great moments between all of these actors here. Francis McDormand, Jesse Buckley, Claire Foy, Rooney Mara, uh, and Ben Whishaw, who was in the Oscar conversation earlier in the year and then all of a sudden fell out. And I, I thought this was a film that should have had numerous, and I mean numerous, acting nominations. I thought Claire Foy should have gotten a nomination. Rooney Mara was amazing. And for some reason, people only started looking at the script as we were winding down, which is why I didn't expect this to get a Best Picture nomination. As a Best Picture contender, what does it have compared to these other films? Well, again, the dialogue is maybe top three possibly the best of the bunch, some would argue. I wouldn't say personally it's the best of the bunch, but again, I'm missing some of those other elements, but you just look at how this movie will leave you once it's over and kind of the process that you're going through, trying to process what they are processing in the film, one, uh, but then two, feeling that emotional kick that you're getting as they are recounting uh, all of the just... Man, it's, it's a tough movie to watch. It really is. But I think Women Talking did its job. Do I ever see myself revisiting it? Not necessarily, but that doesn't make for a bad movie. That just makes for one that is so difficult to process. Women Talking is a really good film. I'm happy it got a Best Picture nomination, even though it's not necessarily in my top ten of the year. The Fablemans is genuinely a good movie. Again, I'm seeing people, and I, I just I gotta get off Twitter, man. It is, it's really... It's pushing me in an angry direction every single day. Why do I do this to myself? Why do we do this to ourselves? We just read things to get angry. And we see these hot takes, and I I'm sitting here frustrated, but I'm doing it to myself. Why do I keep reading tweets? Steven Spielberg's lost it. He doesn't deserve to be here for The Fablemans. It's not even that good of a film. I have a feeling people are saying this just because The Fablemans is a simple movie. It's an easy movie 
movie to watch. It's dealing with relationships, and it's a coming-of-age story. It is, of course, loosely based on Spielberg's experiences. But Sammy Fableman, I mean, not even looking at this through the lens of, oh, that's Steven Spielberg, just as a standalone character, I like the fact that this is showcasing relationships that we see in movies, but we don't see as much of anymore. A mother and a father going through some very stressful times, and they're unsure if they're going to be able to make it together, but at the same time, they have to try their absolute best, and even if that means they don't end up together, they still have a family to raise. They still have children to look after, and I don't see a big problem with bringing something like that, something so simple to the big screen, but putting a little spin on it and making it about a boy who loves the art of filmmaking, who loves the art of cinema. And that's what Sammy Fableman is. And essentially, this is a, a love letter to what Spielberg sees now and what he saw as a child and that childhood love, that passion for filmmaking. And I think that's part of the reason why I enjoyed this movie is because I saw myself in young Sammy Fableman. And obviously, I'm I'm not going into filmmaking right now. But as a kid, I loved making videos. I loved making short films and movies. And, you know, I actually starred in a film in eighth grade that I directed, wrote, and acted in. It's called Runaway Steel. We then had two sequels, Runaway Steel 2 and then Runaway Steel 3, The Rise of Mr. Steel. <laughs> I gotta find these. Paul Dano should have gotten an Oscar nomination. Michelle Williams was really good. Seth Rogen, Judd Hirsch, obviously. Uh, Gabriel LaBelle, did a great job. I think overall this movie works. My criticisms come in with the fact that it may not be the most rewatchable Spielberg movie. It doesn't quite have the depth that maybe a movie like this often needs, uh, especially one when you're nominating it for Best Picture. Okay, I think you need a little bit more there. Is this deserving of a film that I think could win it at the end of the day? Not necessarily, but as a standalone film, I think it is a really good Spielberg movie. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience, and it resonated with me. Kate Blanchett is Lydia Tarr. Tarr is the definition of, uh, it really is the ultimate character study in 2022. It is the best character study that I saw last year out of 200 movies, and her arc from beginning to end, and I mean shot for shot, where she is in the first frame of the film compared to the final frame. That was incredible. Can we also talk about Nina Haas? I mean, nobody's talking about Nina Haas. And I'm like, why Why was she not in the conversation? She plays an integral role in this movie. And what I love about Tar is a lot of the really integral and important stuff happening is in the background, okay? We get a lot of Lydia, you know, having conversations, dialogue, things that we need to know, but maybe aren't as important as what we're trying to piece together happening. And then as that builds up, as we get further into the film, we start to realize, oh no, this is going to affect her career. This is going to send her spiraling out of control in a way that I don't necessarily want to stay. Again, I'm trying to refrain from spoilers here. I just want to bring up integral plot points. But when that spiral starts to happen, it was, again, really subtle. This is a subtle movie. It's not something that's going to spoon-feed you every step of the way, which is what I appreciate. Now, does that keep this from being a film that I would revisit or rewatch down the road? I mean, in the distant future. I'll rewatch it eventually, but it's not one that I've really wanted to revisit I have chewed on it, I have thought about it long after it was over, but it is a lengthy, you know, dialogue-filled character study that was so much to chew on after it was over. I need time before I go back and revisit it, but I feel like when I revisit it, it could make its way up this list just a bit more. I think as a film, as a structured product, putting aside my full-on emotions, the entertainment factor, all of that, which I can't do when I make a list... But just judging this as a product, it's one of the best made and packaged movies of 2022. No doubt in my mind, it has a lot going for it. You know, should the score have won Best Score at the Critics' Choice Awards? No. But cinematography-wise and some of those other elements, you know, simple, subtle, effective. It's an effective film. It's an effective character study. Kate Blanchett, I believe, should at least be in the conversation to take home the Oscar. But again, we talk about experiences, and I like to go off of emotion, the entertainment side of things, just a bit more. If 
it's a good final product, right? If it has glaring issues, then I put emotions aside. I say, no, that's not a recommendation. That's not a movie worth watching, all of this. But Avatar The Way of Water, I think, has a solid enough script, not the best script of these 10 films, solid enough, interesting enough characters that we know uh, that were firmly built up in that first movie, but it takes them in fresh and interesting directions. But you want to talk about a theatrical experience. I mean, visually, this is the best movie of 2022. No doubt in my mind, no competition. I've only watched it in 3D, so I haven't even experienced it in 2D yet. And I'm sure watching this in IMAX without the 3D is just as good. But Avatar The Way of Water firmly captures what a theatrical experience should be. And it's... Yet another film on this list, we'll talk about the other one, that is helping save the box office. It's bringing people out to the theater. It's doing great in the U.S., but internationally, this film is absolutely crushing. And I think that should be accounted for when you're nominating movies for Best Picture. You, you want to try to get a big one in there. If there's no quality big ones, all right, fine. But Avatar The Way of Water is a quality film with quality characters and then you're going to get those who are rolling their eyes. They're like, ah, Asta, but I mean, is this the most original story of all time? No, it's not. And I'll admit that. Are there things about the villains that were extremely cliche? Yeah, sure. I agree with that. Do they go off on a few tangents? I mean, with the three-hour runtime, you're going to get a couple of subplots that aren't quite as effective as the movie wants them to be. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The movie's lengthy. It's long. Three hours? It's, it's, it's a long time, man. Did I love the fact that they got Sigourney Weaver to play a de-age character when they could have just cast somebody new? I get why they did it, but I'm like, you could have just... I mean, I could tell that was Sigourney Weaver, so it was a little bit... I don't know, it was a little bit weird. And then there, like I said, a couple of subplots I didn't love. It's a long movie, so when I tell people they need to go see it in the theater, I have to say, well, it, it's long, okay? But it's worth it. It's long, but it's worth it. That's what she said! <laughs> the Banshees of Inishirin. The Banshees of Inishirin, I talked about amazing scripts, amazing screenplays, the conversation we were having with women talking, how that was one of the best scripts of the year. This one is right up there. I believe Banshees is authentic, it's interesting, it's emotional, and it's so simple. Martin McDonough, he continues to outdo himself. He is such a good director, but he's also such a good writer, and you can see that, you can feel that while you're watching Banshees. There's... Really nothing else like this from 2022. Something so simple, a relationship between two friends where all of a sudden one of those friends says, I, I don't like you anymore. And then the other one's like, and I feel like I would be Colin Farrell's character in this case. I'd be sitting there going, why, 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 why? What's your reasoning? What's your rationale behind not wanting to be my friend? I'm cool, right? But you want to talk about all of the things that come together to make great filmmaking. Cinematography, outstanding. Editing, simple, really good. Not fully effective, but it works. Brendan Gleeson, Colin Farrell, Kerry Condon, Barry Keoghan, everybody, everybody in this movie is outstanding. The comedy, I mean, it's a dark comedy. That's kind of what it is at its core. It's one of the funnier movies of the year. Yeah, there are things about the dialogue. You have to get used to their phrases and understand, okay, what's that word mean? What's that phrase mean? Obviously, you're intending on saying that. There were points where I said, well, maybe I need captions. You know, I watched a screening, a press screening. Maybe I needed the captions, but it's absolutely okay because it's so effective. And it's the type of movie you're watching and you're going, I, I just don't know what I can compare this to from this year. Yeah, you can compare this to other movies in Martin McDonough's filmography, but he keeps bringing us these different and really emotional stories. Also, why was the donkey not nominated for Best Supporting Actor? I don't... I mean, there should have at least been a mention there. Okay, what a great performance there. But it really is. It's Colin Farrell and Brennan Gleeson, the back and forth and how it escalates to a level. Different kind of escalation, but it does somewhat get out of hand by the time we get to the end. And, you know, there were times when I felt as if they could expand on a character or expand on a conversation. The ending... It's not going to be for everyone, but I was satisfied the more I thought about it. Not immediately, but as I processed the ending of this film, I said, you know what? I'm happy they did it, and I'm happy. This is pretty high up on my list. All right, these next three movies I have talked about at length on this channel, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but I will start with my number three, and that's Everything Everywhere All at Once, and how this was just such a drastically 
different and somewhat baffling experience the first time I watched it because I had never seen anything like this movie. Rick and Morty, I get, I mean, somebody called this a live action Rick and Morty fever dream on Twitter. I'm like, that's well, yeah, I know Rick and Morty, not the best topic of conversation right now because what's happening with Justin Roiland, but I want to make the comparison because you can, because there are so many things that happen in everything, everywhere, all at once that I've never seen on the big screen ever sequences, scenes, fight scenes, and character dynamics that are just so different. Michelle Yeoh is amazing. I mean, she's amazing. She carries scenes on her shoulders. She gives us the right amount of emotion. Her relationship with Kihi Kwan's character is outstanding. I believe both deserved nominations. I think everything about this movie deserves a nomination, to be honest with you. The editing, uh, the music-filled sequences, the color grading. I mean, it's just a beautiful film. And the Daniels have out done themselves. I like Swiss Army Man, but this is this is different because this incorporates a lot of things that every age group can love from the hilarious and somewhat raunchy humor to the multiverse trap. I mean, that's a big topic. That was a big deal last year with Doctor Strange. You see, that's the thing. All of these other movies I've made comparisons, even Banshees, you know, Avatar, obviously Tar. I'm like, ah, it's, this is kind of like that. This is, I've, it's so distinct. I've never really seen anything like it. And that's a testament. Whether you like that or you hate that, and it did take two watches for me to fully realize that I am in love with this movie, but after that second watch and I was able to appreciate things more and you know answer one or two questions I had, uh, it has become one that I've watched more times over and I can't wait to watch again. I love this movie. I really do. Edward Berger, All Quiet on the Western Front. I'm so happy this had a resurgence. I am so freaking happy this had a resurgence or a surgence. Wait, it was a resurgence? Well, I was convinced that this wasn't getting any love. I'm like, that. nobody's talking about it. It wasn't winning any awards. And then all of a sudden, you had the BAFTAs, and it starts getting nominated. It got nominated for 14 BAFTAs. I'm like, oh, well, then it's going to get a Best Picture nomination. Duh, as it should, because this is, everybody wants to say it, it absolutely is the case, an anti-war film, but it's filled with war. It's an anti-war film. That's the message. That's the theme here. But to get there, you have to see all of this play out. Violence, gore, brutality uh, on a scope that I haven't really seen in a war film in quite some time. Obviously, this is a remake of the original movie, but technically they're saying this is based more off of certain things from the book. They change the perspective. They change certain elements. They change characters, obviously. But it's the same result, I assume, and you're getting the same emotional impact as you would from really any perspective from any country. I mean, you could show us any side of this war and you essentially have a character that goes in really enthusiastic, the messaging getting you hyped up. And uh, one of the first scenes in the movie is he gets his uniform. There's a little blood stain on it because that's a uniform that has been re reused over and over and over, and I'm sitting back going, oh, this is the type of movie that we're in for, isn't it? It's so uplifting for the first 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden you get brutality over and over and over right in your face, and not everyone's going to love that because not everyone likes to see that, but that is the reality. That's the reality of war, and I love seeing that portrayed. I love war films in general because you always get a certain type of emotion from a war film that you don't get, that you can't get. You can't replicate that from any other genre because it's a distinct feeling uh, that unnerves you because you know what you're watching could have been the case in real life. And that in itself is tragic yet beautiful. All in all, do I love it as much as I love 1917? No, but I think it is on that level in terms of quality. The technical aspects, obviously, but uh, just some of those war scenes. The scene with the tanks, one of the best scenes of the year. Top three. But number one, Top Gun Maverick. Let's ride into the danger zone together, baby. This is amongst the best sequels I've ever seen. Here's the crazy thing for me. I like the first Top Gun. It's okay. It's of its time. It didn't quite have that impact. I watched it getting ready for this, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's a movie. Uh, it's not bad. 
I get why people loved it, but there are things about it, like the romance, the relationship. I didn't think that was handled all that well. Goose, obviously Maverick and Goose, that's the best. That's the highlight of the film. And that's really the one story point that carries over into Top Gun Maverick that plays into it in the biggest way. But for me, it was showcasing what you can do in terms of blockbuster filmmaking, using CGI, but just a little bit, but going more practical to a point to where it just mesmerizes you, uh, keeps your jaw on the floor. And I look at Tom Cruise here, and I say, Tom Cruise, we don't deserve you as an action star. Here's the funny thing. I've never been the biggest Tom Cruise fan. Uh, Yeah, you have all the real life stuff, but growing up, I saw him as a guy who was just doing action movies, and I never appreciated the the quality of his acting. Then I saw a movie like Magnolia, and I'm like, okay, well, (laughs) he can act, and he's phenomenal in that movie. But Top Gun Maverick, this is a different kind of acting. He's committing to the role, and and I know I've said before, he flies the jet, and yeah, he's he's doing that. He's He's not acting like he's flying a jet. He's actually flying the jet, but That's part of it. That's part of the performance here. You have to commit so heavily to a role like this. It's the same reason why I love Keanu Reeves, because he puts his body at risk for the performance, right? Tom Cruise putting his body at risk for Mission Impossible, but for Top Gun, he's flying a jet. He's flying a jet. Could you do that? No, unless you are a pilot. But he's a movie star. He's doing things that every movie star has dreamed about doing. Performances aside, I think this is a really great movie. Somebody said, ah, it's just a retread of things. They're doing the the run in Star Wars. It's the that's a repetitive formula, but it's a formula that works. It's what they needed to do with this film. And they show this over and over and over, training for battle, this battle where people they may or may not come home. In the back of your mind, you believe they're going to come home, but while you're watching, you're like, I, I don't know. I don't know, this is a dogfight that I've never seen before. I like the fact that they don't identify the enemy by name. It's just the enemy. There are so many things about this movie, the subtlety. And then the direction from Joseph Kaczynski was flawless. This is everything you want in a big emotional blockbuster. And no, it's not the artsiest movie. No, it's not the most comprehensive script I've ever seen. But it did everything it needed to do as a sequel. It elevated the first film. It's better than the first film, way better, in my opinion, and it is the best theatrical experience of 2022. Avatar's close. I love the Batman, but this is number one. Have I talked enough? I think I've talked enough. I'm sorry this video is so long. I'm going to end it right now. Leave your lists, leave a comment, leave a like, only if you want to. Thanks for being here. I'm going to be back with some very early Oscar predictions soon, and uh, again, this was fun to do.